Our scripture reading is from the first letter of John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. This can be found in the New Testament section of the Pew Bible on page 241. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love and those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and yet hate a brother or sister are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Where, there you are. That's a long passage, but it's one of my absolute favorites. So thank you for making your way all the way through it. <laughs> Jesus was with his disciples when a lawyer stood up to test him. Teacher, he said, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus said to him, well, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, also passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved to compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? 
the young man said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus responded, go and do likewise. For many of us, this story is as familiar as a favorite childhood fairy tale. We've heard it so many times that I sometimes wonder if it's kind of lost its punch. Yet as we finish up this sermon series, comparing some of the characteristics of Christian nationalism with what Jesus taught in the gospel, I believe this parable to be right at the heart of the matter. The different ways one could answer the question, who is my neighbor, reveal a lot about the stark contrast between Christian nationalism and Jesus' gospel. And it's a powerful scripture passage to have in mind if you want to articulate those differences to someone else. The power of this passage is in its details. First of all, the whole setup is a test. This lawyer is trying to test Jesus, but he asks a question he already knows the answer to. To have eternal life, one must love the Lord with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jewish children learn this from very early in their lives. It's known as the Jewish Shema. Jesus affirms his response, says, yep, you got it right. But then the tricky part comes. Notice what is said about why the lawyer asks the next question. He wants to justify himself. This is justify as in bringing into alignment, like we justify the margins on a page. In other words, he wants to follow the letter of the law absolutely correctly, so he needs specifics. Who do I have to love? Are there any exceptions? Those are the unspoken questions under, underneath the question, who is my neighbor? The second thing to notice is that the two people who don't stop to help the half-dead man are religious leaders, so they know this same law about loving your neighbor. Why don't they stop? As he does so often in scripture, Jesus is pointing out their hypocrisy. But the most potent element of this story for the people who were listening to Jesus all those years ago would have been the identity of the person who did stop to help. Jews and Samaritans despised each other. Jews saw Samaritans as morally and spiritually corrupt, impure because they were Jews who had gone on to marry outside of the faith or adopt the culture of another empire. But it's a Samaritan who comes to the aid of his enemy. A Samaritan cares for the man, takes him to an inn to recover, offers to pay for the related expenses. And here is the crux of the story. Who is my neighbor? Jesus would say everyone, but especially those we think of as enemies, the people we fear or make us feel least comfortable, the people we despise. In the United States today, the immigrant is our neighbor, the person of color, is our neighbor, the unhoused veteran, the mom looking for food to feed her family, the queer teenager, the drag queen, the scary looking guy selling drugs on the street corner, the people who practice a different religion from our own, and even the Christian nationalists. They are all our neighbors. And Jesus says to enter the kingdom of God, we must love them. No exceptions. And therein lies the contrast with Christian nationalism. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, a recent study by the Public Religion Research Institute and the Brookings Institute found five characteristics of Christian nationalism. Anti-black, anti-immigrant, anti-gay, anti-Semitic, 
and pro-traditional patriarchal gender roles. But what lies underneath all of those is fear. Fear of our country changing. Fear of becoming the minority. Fear of losing power and therefore control. And that fear becomes hate, which is then targeted at those who were once on the margins, but now pose a threat. One way to deal with fear is to spread it, to make sure other people are afraid too, by telling lies, making false accusations, painting the other as dangerous or less than human. We see so much of that in our country these days even in our churches. A couple of weeks ago, I, I received what appeared to be a form letter addressed, Dear Pastor, from a member of another church. The bulk of the letter was a series of either-or questions, each starting with, Do you, in capital letters, like, Do you want poisoned apples or a perfect juicy pear? Each question posed a scenario that was meant to be frightening or provoking, a threat of what our government will do if we continue on the path we're on. The threats included bankrupting Social Security, impoverishing elderly people, restricting our constitutional rights, mutilating children, using government resources to support illegal immigrants. The whole letter was intended to foment fear and then claim the higher moral ground. These were questions that reflected fear of neighbor, not love of neighbor. Now, in this country, we value free speech, and I don't begrudge this woman's decision to send me this letter. And I certainly believe that everyone should be able to answer these questions and act on their answers. What I take issue with is suggesting that the opinions expressed in the, the letter are Christian, that they in any way reflect the teachings of Jesus. Jesus did not provoke fear or encourage hate. He did not try to objectify or demean. He did not make ungrounded accusations or provocative threats. His was a gospel of love, love for all people, and particularly those on the margins. I want to end this sermon series with the scripture passage we heard read a little bit earlier. We don't know who wrote 1 John, but we do know the circumstances. It was written shortly after Jesus, or wait, Jesus had been crucified. The young church that was born after his death worked hard to faithfully follow his teachings, and the apostles wrote letters to help them understand and apply the gospel of love. But by the time 1 John was written, some 75 years later, the church had been around for a couple of generations, and some people had begun to break away from Jesus' teachings to teach other ideas, particularly Gnosticism. John speaks of these new teachers as false prophets, and with this letter, he tries to help his readers get grounded again in what Jesus actually taught. I find his words so beautiful and so very appropriate for the time in which we're living. In some, he says, Christianity is centered on love of God and love of neighbor. If you don't love your neighbor, you don't know God, because God is love. If you do know God, you don't need to be afraid of those who are different from you. God's perfect love drives out fear, and we are to love as God does. This is the Christian gospel. This is the faith that Jesus taught. This is what Christianity is. It is care for the poor, not power over them. It is seeking peace, not acting out violence. It is grounded in love and does not provoke fear. 
These are the teachings of Jesus. And this is who we are called to be as his followers. May it be so. Amen.